Today we're talking about color calibration, calibrating your screens. Is it worth it? Should you do it? And if you do, what are you gonna use? Greetings and salutations. Good morning and welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live three times a week show all about video and photo and live streaming and stuff and that to general topic of area, area of, anyway, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 a.m. Pacific here at youtube.com slash photo Joseph. It is a live show. So if you're participating live, you get to participate in the comments in the chat room. I get to pull you guys up here and say hello to you and talk about secrets and all kinds of fun stuff, which is, of course, the best part of the show, being able to participate live. So we're going to do the quick show. Then we'll uh, do a quick little break over, turn over to the Q&A. We'll answer all the cues there, or at least and try to. We'll do our best. So today we're talking about color calibration. I picked this up from B&H. This is the Spider 5 Pro. This is a handy dandy little device for slapping on your screen and doing color calibration. The basic idea is quite simple. This is a, I think they call it color, colorometer, color, color, color meter. It measures the color. Uh, here, let's take a quick look at this thing over at B&H. 189 for this little doohickey here, the Data Color Spider 5 Pro Display Calibration System. That is what we're working with today. The idea is you put this thing on your screen. You actually slap it onto the screen here. And the software that it comes with runs through a series of color displays while this thing monitors it. And then it builds what you could effectively call a LUT for those who are used to working with LUTs. It's remapping your color space. You load that profile and it says, okay, your color, your monitor is outputting this, but what we really want is this shade of red to look like this and this blue to look like that and so on. And it remaps the colors to give you what is presumably an accurate color space. Now, this begs the question, do you need to do this? Let's start off with the, yes, you do need to do this. If you're printing, at home, studio, whatever. If you're printing, if you own a high-end color printer and you're working on your photographs and you're obviously doing your own color tweaking to those photos and then printing them, then you absolutely, unequivocally, without a shadow of a doubt, want to do color calibration. I actually don't know how, I don't think this ties into print calibration. I don't do print. I've never, ever had a printer that I could calibrate. So I know nothing about that space, but I do know that if you are going to print, then you want it to be calibrated. This way, what you see on screen is going to, as closely as possible, represent what you see on paper. It's never going to be exactly accurate, right? Because you're talking about a reflective versus a transmittive surface. You've got paper that is reflecting light, boom, boom. You've got a screen that is transmitting light. So they're always going to be a difference, but this allows you to get them as close as possible so that you can have something when you put them side by side, you go, yep, that was good. So in that case, no question about it, you need to calibrate. But many of us only go to screen. We do our work and then we put it up online, put it on the YouTubes, put it on, well, for photographs, putting it on Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Uh, we're putting it on our web pages, we're putting it on our galleries and our spung by galleries and so on. And we have absolutely this much control over what other people's displays look like. So I have always approached this from the sense of if you are not printing, then you probably really don't need color calibration because if I calibrate my monitor and I get my monitor technically accurate and then I color grade to get it looking the way that I want and then I put it on your monitor and your monitor is not color calibrated, well, your, the picture on your screen is not gonna look the same way it did on mine. So my theory would be that basically I'm gonna assume, rightfully so, that the vast majority of people have not calibrated their screens because they haven't and therefore I want to make my image look as good as possible on my uncalibrated screen. And if I'm gonna be really precise about it, well, as precise as one can be, I'm gonna look at it on multiple uncalibrated displays. I've got an Apple laptop here. I might look at it on my iMac screen. I might even pull it over to my iPad and see, and now I've got this whole Apple thing going. And maybe I've got, if I've got access to a PC, I'm gonna look at it there. And then you get like gamma shifts on PCs. That can be a bit of a problem too, but at least I'm looking at it the way most people are going to look at it. As far as knowing whether it's accurate or not, my advice has always been, and I've talked about this a whole bunch, is to ensure that your black and your white points are actually black and white. And you that looking at your screen, forget that. That is looking at the numbers. You take the eyedropper, you bring up a RGB histogram, whatever your preferred way is, and you ensure that when you're looking at a neutral color, a black, a white, a gray, something in between, that it is truly neutral, right? If it's, if when you look at the RGB readouts, if it's 200, 200, 200, that's neutral. If it's 200, 200, 190, it's not. You're off a little bit. So you adjust your colors until that's accurate. Forget about what you see on screen. You get your whites, your blacks, your neutrals accurate, technically accurate, and that is about the best that you can hope for. So that's if you are not going to go to print. But then we get into the space of video 
We're in space of video. Again, you do have other controls. You've got Rec 7 on color spaces and all these different color spaces you have to deal with and other TVs that are calibrated, not calibrated, and so on. And in this situation, I think it gets a little bit different because you do want it to be as accurate as possible because the spread of what's going on out there is so much different. Like if you walk into a uh, Costco or Best Buy or something and you walk by the TV displays, they all look massively different. So at this, at this point, you really do want to be putting out something that is as true, as neutral, as accurate as possible. Now you could still want to do it as accurate as possible for photos on your screen and then switch back and forth and try and see, well, maybe find a balance between them. And that is where this guy comes in. If you want to have that really as accurate as possible yet still switch over to look at what it's going to look like on a non-calibrated screen, then you got to calibrate. If you are printing, you got to calibrate. And even if you're printing not your own printer, but you're shipping out to print, probably a good idea to calibrate too. So there are definitely spaces to calibrate. There are reasons to calibrate. And while I have been quite bullish on not calibrating, I am starting to change my attitude a little bit about it. And I just got this thing on Friday and I calibrated my two screens that I'm using in my room there. And one of the cool things about it is it makes the two match. Now they're very different panels, very different manufacturers, so it's not a perfect flawless match, but it's way closer than it was before. So let's take a look at that. We're going to look at how this thing works, but I want to show you first the before and after. So here's this. These are my two screens side by side without calibration. Now one of the things I will say that it did, which was really surprisingly cool to me, was it had me adjust the brightness of my screen, and I had my screens way too bright. They were way too bright. So they've been toned down quite a bit based off of the calibration, based off of what it says you should do. And it does that by actually combination of monitoring the uh, light in the room itself and then monitoring the light coming out of the, uh, the display. And it had me bring them way down. And now that they're down, they're actually a lot easier to look at. Before, I was, I was honest, I was kind of like, this is a little bit much. You know, you kind of don't want to turn down the brightness of your screen because it looks so good. But I realized it actually is a lot better when it's dimmer. So it had me calibrate uh, adjust the brightness on the two screens to get them to match. So here's this display here is with the brightness adjusted. I didn't want to touch my brightness, but that is uncalibrated versus calibrated. Now look at the massive difference. Let me go full screen on this. The massive difference between these two. Now this is uncalibrated, and this is clearly very, very cold. The whites are very, very blue. We go to calibrated, and I would say it actually feels kind of warm. I'm looking at it going, I think this is really warm, but I've also been looking at it so cold for so long that I think that my eyes and my brain needs a little time to reset. Like I said, I just did this on Friday when I walked in this morning and I, I kind of, I honestly, I felt a little bit less like it was overly warm. So we'll give it some time, see how it goes. But when we look at the before and after in here, it is a huge, huge difference. So we're obviously looking at a picture of an X-Rite color checker. And even in here, when you look closely, you can see some differences between the two, whereas this one, they are matching much more, uh, much more cleanly, much nicer. So it is, it is an interesting thing to do. So if you are interested in this space, if you're interested in calibrating, then I'm gonna recommend you pick one of these up because it's kind of awesome. Now, let's take a look at the actual process of doing it. Let me get out a full screen on here. And it really is super easy. Um, I'm not going to show you the whole process here, but basically you install the software, obviously. Incidentally, the software installer is like written in 1984 or something. It keeps coming up with not optimized for your computer. It still works fine. Just run through it, ignore the warnings, and just keep going. It works, but it's like it seems to be kind of old software. Um, you'll start by doing a little interview. It says, has your monitor been on for at least half an hour so it's fully warmed up? Um, is your room environment set the way you like it? And, and so on. And then it'll run through a list of the things that it's going to do to do the calibration. And one of the options is to adjust the brightness on your screen. And here's an interesting thing. When I did it in my room, in my studio, it was in my office rather, it was uh, by default it wanted to do adjust the brightness. When I did it out here and I told it that I was on a laptop, it disabled that. It said recommended not doing that. And I think that's because it knows as you move around, your brightness is going to have to adjust because your environment is not controlled. I overrode that and said, no, go ahead and do the brightness. And because I'm in this room, it said way too bright, which it is. This is too bright to be doing any kind of color accurate work because obviously this is set up for being on camera. So we've kind of ignored that part. I, I just went, okay, fine. Don't do the brightness. Bypass that. And then the next step of it, it brings up a screen here and it says, uh, you know, pl place the spider on the display as shown. You place it here and then hit next. So that's what we're going to do. Let's take a look at this view. 
you take, oh, actually here, let me do this first. Let me do a quick little close up because I haven't shown you this thing yet. So this is the Spider itself. This is effectively a lens cap slash counterweight for holding it off the back end of your monitor. There's the sensors in there. So just like any camera lens when you're not using it, keep it nicely protected. It has a quarter 20 thing on the bottom. I don't really know why, it, but it does. Uh, Anyway, but that's it. That's all there is to it. Very, very simple, very straightforward. When you do the room environment reading, you just leave it closed like this. You set it on your desk next to the screen, and that sensor there monitors the brightness. And then when you do the actual screen test, you just put this on the display itself. So let's go ahead back to this view. I'm going to put this over. You use the um, as a kind of a counterweight, and I realize this is a bit dark there. Sorry, the lights are not pointing in the right direction for this. But we just put that on there, and then I click Next, and it starts running through a, a calibration cycle, and that's it. It's going to bring up white, and it's going to bring a bunch of different colors, and it's going to base the calibration off of that. Um, so I'm not going to let it go through the whole thing, because it'll take a little while to do. But that's it. I'll, I'll throw it back up when it throws up a pretty color. But it goes through black and white and RGB and gray. It's doing a gray right now. It does a bunch of different tones, and it bases it off of that. And then it creates a profile, and you can name the profile. Look, now it's in red. Uh, you can create a pro, you can name the profile whatever you want in there. I think it's a good idea to put a date on it so you know. And then you can have it remind you every whatever you want, recommend it as every month to recalibrate. And then to once a month it pops up and says, hey, it's time to recalibrate, and you pop that on. Now, going back to the discussion in my other room, I've got my iMac and then the BenQ 4K 32 inch display that's next to it, which incidentally I will be doing a video on. I've been using it for a while. That's going to be coming up soon. The BenQ has its own calibration software in it, which is compatible with the Spider. So oh, there's already done. Uh, oh no, here, look, it's doing the brightness thing now. Uh, so you can see here it is adjusting screen brightness because I did leave that on. Let me actually bring it up this view. And so while you obviously can't see it if I adjust the brightness on my screen, I would adjust the brightness and then click this update button. It rereads it and it says the target is 200 CD over M squared, whatever that means. Um, so there I turned it down too much. So I'll bring the brightness up a little bit, hit update again. It rereads it and it determines whether you have to adjust your brightness anymore. Now what's kind of funny is that the, oh, so it's way over 260. Anyway, it's obviously it's not ideal for this setup in here. Um, but that's how it adjusts the brightness. It tells you, okay, adjust the brightness here, there, get it into the target range. Incidentally, that's actually, this is a really good point. I'm glad this came up. Um, I discovered this. You know how you've got your brightness display buttons on your computer keyboard, um, on a Mac, to, I have no idea what's on a PC, to make it brighter or darker? Those increments are quite big. So in this case, what I needed to do on my other room was bring this up and go into the displays. Also, this is confused because it sees my mirrored display and it doesn't know exactly what it's calibrating. Um, I had to go in here and bring the right display and adjust the brightness on this. If you do it here, you have a lot more accuracy than if you use the button. See how much it, ch it bumps with each button? So that's one hit. That's sliding. That's how much it's bumping. So it's a lot. So you can do this manually a lot more precise. So just FYI on there. Um, if you're doing it and you're not able to get the brightness accurate enough, open that display and grab the little slider. Uh, anyway. So that's about it, right? And then, like I said, in a month, it's going to pop up and say, hey, you need to do this again. And that's all there is to it. So oh, the BenQ, I was saying, it has its own built-in calibration software, which is compatible with a variety of hardware, the Spider 5 Pro being one of them. So I have, so far, I've only used it with the Spider software. My next step will be to use it using their own software and see if that's any different, see if it's any more accurate. I mean, I don't know how you really tell. Um, mainly, though, I want to see how it looks compared to the iMac, if it gets the two closer to being accurate or closer to the same than they are now. So that's it. That's really it. That's super straightforward. Uh, plug it, you know, install the software, plug it in, run through the wizard, and you're done. It really doesn't take much to do. And you can move it around all your different computers and recalibrate all of them. It's pretty straightforward. So that is all there is to it. I say I recommend. I think it. For most people, I think it's worth doing. For most photographers who are serious about their color, I think it's worth doing. But I think you really want to be aware that most people will not be looking at a calibrated screen. And so you should be going back and forth. And of course, if you're printing, then even if you're not printing yourself, then it's great to be sending your printer something that is that looks good on your screen because they're going to be working with a calibrated screen. The single most important thing, though, at the end of the day is ensuring that your neutral tones, your blacks, grays, and whites, are truly neutral. And that's with the eyedropper or looking at the histogram, doctor scope, however you're working. Make sure that your whites are neutral, and then you know that your colors are true. And if you decide you want to make your whites cooler, well, then that is a creative decision, but at least you know that you're starting with a neutral point. Okay? All right, guys, that's it. Let's switch over to the Q&A. We'll be right back. Thank you.